Okay, folks, so this lesson is going to begin our series through the Gospel of John. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Gospel of John through a mystical lens. And we're going to do that because, well, John is in the tradition of Jewish mystics, and the Gospel is a mystical letter. What we need to do today is talk about what that means. And so the problem we have today is... We don't have an awareness of the mystical traditions and that mystical or mysticism, when you hear those words for many people, now maybe not you if you're watching this video, but for many people in the mainstream church, the word mystical or mysticism creates anxiety. It's a bit of a stranger danger, you know, whatever you do, don't look there because the word mystical or mysticism, you know, it conjures up visions of crazy cults or something like that. And of course, yes, those things can happen. Those are everywhere. Doesn't matter what area of life you're in, we can have those issues of people taking them too far. There has always been a mystical side to Judaism and Christianity, and there always will be. And what I want to do through this series is to introduce this to as many people as possible so that we can see it, the word mystical, the idea of mysticism, so that we can see it through eyes of truth, and that we can recognize that many things in our own Christian practice are mystical. They're mystical in nature, but they become so mundane, they no longer have the mystical experience that they were intended to have. We've gotten used to them. And of course, the tradition I'm speaking in is modern Western Christianity, and Westerners do not tend to like, particularly Protestants, do not tend to like the mysteries of the Bible that say Eastern Orthodox, they live with far greater sense of the mysteries than we do in the West. So this is what I'd like to do is have people take a look at it without having their anxiety go up. Now it's a vast topic, so basically I'm going to show you a window into John so that you'll know it's there. You'll know where to look, but ultimately, I'm showing you just a, a very small slice of mysticism. And what I think will happen, and this is the opinion of many scholars, is that when you see what John is doing, when you see what he's trying to communicate and the way he's doing it, he builds tremendous structure into his gospel letter. When you see the structure, when you see this, and what he's communicating, it'll change the way you read John. You'll read John better. You'll have a deeper understanding of what he's communicating. Even if you don't agree with the assessment that John's a mystic, once you see the patterns that he has, it'll help you understand the message. You'll have more enjoyment reading John, knowing what he's doing, than if you don't know what he's doing. So that's part of my goal with this. Okay. The background picture, I'm using this photo because it represents the mystical view. The mystics want to get in touch with the reality beyond the veil. So it's an attempt to rend the heavens, to see beyond the veil of our present reality, into that heavenly sphere. And it isn't just so that you can say, oh wow, isn't that cool? It's so that you can gain a more profound sense of reality everywhere. And what's so cool is by being exposed to that unveiled reality, you, by the very nature of it, will transform. That's why Paul says, with unveiled faces, we are being transformed into the likeness, by the Spirit, of course. And it's very much like Moses, you know, when he came down Mount Sinai and his face is radiant, radiating is what it says. He entered that realm of the divine and what he was able to do then is bring some of that reality back to the Israelites. And that's the power of the mystical practices. So, as I mentioned, part of my mission is to try to take some of the mystery out of the mystical. This series is really intended to be a path for an introduction to this topic, 
and then more importantly, to help you see the Gospel of John with new eyes, that is, with new insight, with new inner sight. And what we realize is that within the practices, the mystical practices, one of the main concepts is light. Seeking spiritual enlightenment to raise your awareness of the existence of God in all areas of your life, in all situations, to be able to see the God even in the mundane of everyday life, and to recognize that God is nearby. He permeates all of our reality. Now, this is what we have to fight against is that in the West, especially in the West, post Enlightenment, post scientific revolution, there's a conception of God who's distant, uh, up there, far away in the heavens, the old man up in the sky, but he lets us run things down here on earth. That's not reality. God is a God who permeates all things and permeates our minds and helps in, uh, enlighten our minds. Now, anytime that you depict the idea of enlightenment, things being illuminated, how do we do it? With a light bulb. Now, you know, typically what will happen is someone will say, ah, they have a picture where, with a, a brain with a light bulb going off. Here, you have the light bulb with the brain inside. It's a little bit of a change here, but it's that aha moment when something is illuminated, something clicks that you didn't quite grasp before. This is my goal. As you become aware of the basics of Jewish and then later Christian mysticism, and then you see how John is writing, it's suddenly as if the light bulb goes off. Oh, now I see what John is doing. And to be sure, we're not going to be doing lessons on the spiritual practices themselves or spiritual disciplines that help you go down that path. So if you say, ah, I'm open to this, I want to go down that path, well, you'll have to go find the spiritual practices or maybe a spiritual director to help you or the spiritual disciplines that'll help you move down that path. But really, what I want to do is the introduction to make you more aware, to see what John is up to. And so what I'm going to do today in this lesson is I'm just going to simply lay out a series of points. And by the time we get done, I think you'll see what I'm talking about about the idea of mysticism, particularly, and then we'll talk about John. But first of all, there always has been, there always will be a mystical side to both Judaism and Christianity. Now, of course, we have to remember, in John's day, there's no Christianity yet. It's not a formalized religion. There are Christians, those who believe that Jesus is the Messiah but they're all in the Jewish context. They're still engaged in synagogue. And with, with the Jewish scriptures, there is no New Testament. So then John is only working with the Jewish mysticism. He's a Jew, and his audience is largely Jewish that sees Jesus as the promised Messiah of Israel. Or you would have there in Ephesus, you would have what are called God-fearers, Gentiles who have chosen to attach themselves to the synagogue. So they know the scriptures if they've been there for multiple generations. Now, the more you understand the aspects of Jewish mysticism, the more you'll see how it shows up throughout the New Testament. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the Gospels or it's Paul, right? Because Paul, he's regularly engaging mystical ideas, and those are simply part of his upbringing, right? He was brought up training as a Pharisee under Gamaliel. And so, in his letters, he'll just drop things like the first and last Adam, or in Corinthians, he talks about the heavenly man, right? These are mystical ideas, something about the nature of reality in the cosmos. And, you know, with Paul, it's important to notice, Paul just simply lobs these ideas in the middle of a, you know, a sentence. And, and the point is, his audience knows the idea. He doesn't have to stop and explain. They know what he's talking about. We have to do the work to go back and say, what would they have known when Paul writes this very simple sentence? There's a lot behind that. And the same thing with John. Okay, second thing, number two, 
on your handout, make sure you download the handout because that'll help you keep track of all of this as you start weaving all of these pieces together. Jewish and Christian mysticism, they're 100% Bible-based. These are not random wanderings of a crazy person or a cult leader, although, like I said, that can happen. Christian and Jewish mysticism are Bible-based. But these are individuals, the mystics. They have a sense that the Bible is going to speak to us and has more to say than what we see on the surface. Now, I'm going to be doing, in a week or two, probably two weeks, a lesson on different, it's the different senses of Scripture, the ways that we can read Scripture. And there's four ways within Judaism, and there's four ways within Christianity, and they match up. But it's a way for you to go beneath the surface. And the moment you do, the moment you go beneath the surface, you're into the more mystical senses about the text. And it might not be the formalized mystical, but it's mystical nonetheless. But let me give you a quote. This is from a book by Bernard McGinn. Now, this is a great book. It's probably not a book that you would just sit down and read over a weekend, but it's an excellent book to have on hand. So it's called The Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism. And McGinn has this quote. He says this, The mystic, however, he does not seek an academic understanding of the scriptural text. Nor is he or she content with viewing the Bible only as a repository of doctrine or moral regulations. That's how many people read the Bible. The mystics, on the other hand, this is what he says, the mystics want to penetrate to the living source of the biblical message. That is, to the divine word who speaks in and through human words and texts. So if you approach the Bible believing that the Bible has something for you or a message that you don't see on the surface that is in effect hidden, but that helps you engage God through the Word and have it revealed to you, well, welcome to mysticism. Now, again, it might not be as formalized and deep as others will go, but that's a start. Many people I know, many people are seeking that living source of the biblical message. They feel the words are alive and that there's something underneath there it's an interaction, it's an experience we have with the text that we can't quite figure out. And now you're into the more mystical. You want to know the God that's behind the words. And if you approach the Bible that way, then the Bible tends to interact with you in that way. Okay, now, um, number three on your handout. Where does this come from? Where does this start? Well, I mean, it's surely not, you, you can't pinpoint a starting point, but the idea of a wisdom tradition, because wisdom, it extends out of the point where, um, where we're expecting more from the Bible. And, you know, first of all, we'd have to do a whole lesson on wisdom because wisdom isn't information. It isn't answers to questions necessarily. Most people, when they think wisdom, they're thinking just practical wisdom, like every day to day wisdom, you know? But wisdom tradition is about seeing the reality of all things. What's the reality of God's cosmos? You want to know the reality so you can understand the God who is there in reality. And what the Bible does, the Bible always contrasts wisdom with foolishness. That's the biblical way of doing it. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, meaning you will begin to see the reality as it is when you recognize the reality of God. And they contrast that to something, a verse like, a fool says there is no God. And therefore, since they don't believe in the reality that exists around them, their actions are foolishness. And of course, that's not reality. And, oh, by the way, there is a God, and you're subjected to that God whether you believe he exists or not. When we understand the reality of the cosmos, we live differently. And here's what's interesting, though, is wisdom is the inner life of man. So when we look at the Bible, the Bible begins with Torah, 
We say law. That's really not a good translation. Torah means to guide or to instruct, to teach. And we see that Torah is filled with commandments. And then we, when we look at those commandments, we perceive them largely as external. It's external behavior. It's clothing, food, worship practices, tabernacle. Okay? So it's all external. But then eventually, you move through time and you move through the Bible and you get to the wisdom books. There's a shift. Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Job, those are wisdom books. You could argue that many of the Psalms are associated with wisdom, but, you know, overall, the book of Psalms, that's not in the wisdom tradition. But what's wisdom? It's inner. It's inner sight. It's seeing reality as it is, but it happens in our, right, where we can perceive beyond the veil, but not with our physical eyes. So often in these stories, like John healing the blind man, and we can identify with the blind man, but we might not be physically blind, but now I see, and it's spiritual seeing. And what's difficult is it's hard to judge anybody, right? You don't know what's going on inside their mind. They have to be able to produce the fruits outside so that you are aware of something on the inside. And in all religions, you know, we tend to externalize things because we want to see whether you're obeying or not, right? Are you part of our team? You need to wear the right clothes, eat the right food. Is your speech in line with our speech? Did you profess the correct doctrine? That gives us comfort externally so that we can say, ah, I know what's going on inside. But it's the inner life. How do you commune with God? How do you conceptualize God? How do you engage God internally? This is wisdom. Okay. Now, the, the idea of mystical, the, the Greek, or I'm sorry, the New Testament uses the Greek word mysterion. Okay, so mysterion, it's where we get the words for mystical and mystery. Mysterion is something that's hidden, a hidden thing. Now, mysterion comes from a Greek word, muo, which means to shut the mouth. Now, that's interesting, but like a secret, something hidden. And it is kind of funny because uh, one of the sources that I use, it's called the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. When it's talking about the definition of mysterion, it starts by saying that even the derivation of this word is a bit of a mystery. We're not very sure. But this word is used 27 times in the New Testament. Paul, he uses it six times just in the letter to the Ephesians. Notice how many times Paul is talking about the mystery. The mystery of the gospel. The mystery of Christ in us. And the early church saw that, hey, how do we lead people to understand Christ in us? So there are mysterious aspects to the New Testament and to our Christian faith. If we look at the definition of mysterion, a mystery, a secret of which initiation is necessary. Initiation. Now, is there a form of initiation within Christianity? Well, in the, in the early church, uh, baptism and the Lord's suppers. That was the initi That was the initiation into the mysteries of the Christ. Now you could also say, we we do need some sort of initiation, because a brand new Christian, well, they don't they don't fully understand everything there is to know about God and Jesus, and so it takes a level of initiation or teaching or training that will help us see something that we couldn't see before. Right now, the definition, it goes on like this. It says, Mysterion is not something unknowable. Rather, it is what can only be known through revelation. So it's not hidden in a way that can't be known, but a normal human being doesn't quite get it. I mean, think about it. How does a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi from the eastern province of the Roman Empire, crucified as a rebel, how is he now king of all kings? How does he now share a throne with the God in heaven? How does that work? And how is it that when people hear this story, they suddenly go, oh, I think I believe that, and it changes their life, right? So that's why Paul says, look, to the Gentiles, this is foolishness. It makes no sense. It's counter to the ways of the world. And yet what we see, it's made through revelation. God is a God who reveals. 
And as we become enlightened and more aware, we're able to understand that, oh, yes, that is true. That's accurate. That is an accurate depiction of reality. You know, in the early Christians, they also used that word mysterion for the inner dimensions of both the Bible and the religious, uh, and the Christian religion, and the sacraments. So they recognized if you have intent reading and comp- uh, contemplation of the scripture, that they're able to see beyond the words. They're able to go deeper with God. I mean, if we think about So not only are these initiation sacraments, but they're sacraments that are a bit mysterious, right? Baptism, there's a mystery to baptism. This baptismal site is just uh, by the Sea of Galilee, just to the south where the sea enters the Jordan River. But there's a mystery to baptism. All cultures around the world, there is some form of water immersion and a water immersion ritual. It's built into the human condition. And so for the early church, this is an initiation point, and you enter the mystical union with Jesus, Christ in you. Now, the other one, of course, is the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. So this, again, is supposed to be used by the church as a pathway for entering that mystical union of the believer and the Christ. By ingesting the bread and the wine that represents the body and the blood, you are, in a mystical sense, infusing Christ in you. That's the communion, the infusion internally. And this is what's supposed to lead you toward that mystical union. But of course, what happens with all things in life, it can become mundane, rules based, etc. It loses the experiential. So we have these sacraments. There's a mystical aspect to them. And they're supposed to lead us into that mystical union, Christ in us. And this is now part of our normative Christian practice. Okay, now, what I'm going to do, I have a list. It's a list of topics particularly within Jewish mysticism, because that's what John and Paul are going to be dealing with. But I want to show you this list. They repeatedly show up within mystical writings or central themes within mystical writings. And then what we're going to do is say, okay, if these are the themes of the, myst- of the mystics, now let's go look at John. See what we find in John. Oh, look, they're exactly the same. Okay, so the first one, light versus darkness. So there's great attention paid to light versus darkness. Now, when you see that, are they talking physical light? Of course, the answer is no. It's spiritual light, spiritual illumination. And so just as we've been talking about illuminating the mind or the spirit as to the nature of reality, right? Unfortunately, people walk in darkness. It's one of the great issues with humanity. We walk in darkness, delusion. We delude ourselves, and we're even fooled into thinking that our delusion is the light. God wants us to come out of the darkness so that we can see the reality that we exist in. And of course, John begins, it's uh, verse 4 and 5, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's right inside the mystical tradition. Now, the motif of light is repeated over and over in John. And that's different than the other three Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we'll be looking at that going, as we're going through John. Okay, another, another topic of the mystics, and I've, as I've mentioned, is you're really looking at what's the nature of reality? What are, what's the cosmic reality? And so... The mystics, well, they notice something, that throughout the Bible, we find these stories that seem to reveal the nature of reality. There are points, there are stories in the Bible, where the veil is pulled back between the physical reality that we live in and the greater spiritual reality around us. And so, these 
particular verses or these stories, well, they become a focus for the mystics. So what we're going to start with is Genesis 28, 12 and 13. And what this is, is this is when Jacob, Jacob falls asleep and he has a vision of the heavens opening. And you have to notice the cosmic reality is being revealed. We refer to this as Jacob's ladder. And so the heavenly veil is parted. Jacob sees a ladder or a mound, or in this artist's depiction, it's a staircase. That's how some people have translated the Hebrew. But anyway, you do that. It's something that's connecting heaven and earth, reaching into the heavens with the angels ascending and descending. And then who's at the top? It's the Lord. And so Jacob is, in a sense, seeing into the reality beyond. Okay? Well, what do we find right away in John? The very beginning, first chapter, there's a discussion with Nathaniel, who's going to become a disciple, and there's a direct reference to Genesis 28 12. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, as if Jesus is the one who connects heaven and earth. Now, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. We'll cover it in more detail later. But one thing we note is as you keep reading in John, and this is much more in John than the other Gospels, there's more focus on Jesus ascending or Jesus coming down from the heavens. Because John's telling us that the reality is Jesus is the connecting point between God and humanity. He's the way to get to God. He's the, in the nature of reality, if everybody could pull back the veil, they would see that Jesus is the connecting point. Okay, so there's one, Genesis 28, the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a mystical book, and the mystics love it. And because Ezekiel 1 starts off with the heavens being opened, and the throne of God being unveiled in the heavens. And what's really interesting about this vision of this heavenly reality, again, notice the parting of the, the heavens so we can see what's beyond, is that if you read Ezekiel 128, there is a likeness sitting on the throne. So it says, high above the throne, there was a figure like that of a man. Interesting. Now, what you're entering is a paradox. That's one of, the, one of my points in a minute. If God has no image, but there's a likeness of a man above the throne, well, what's that? Right? Who or what is this figure? How is it possible that a God that has no image, or a God that's beyond any image, can have the likeness of a man? Who's the likeness? That's the paradox. Okay. Now, you go to the end of Ezekiel, there's a second vision, and that second vision is the renewed temple. And this is one John's going to emphasize. It's the renewed temple in Jerusalem, and that Jesus is the temple. And he does this in a number of ways. Not only does John 2.19, Jesus refers to himself as the temple, but later, it's John 7.38. Jesus is at the Festival of Tabernacles. And Jesus has this rather ambiguous saying, and it connects directly back to Ezekiel. Now, the next one, this gets even better. They're building on each other. Daniel 7, looking into the heavens once again, and there's the pattern. And this is a vision into the throne room of God, breaking through that veil. And this time we get the Son of Man, the Son of Man being led into the throne room of God. And this Son of Man is one who actually shares authority with God, co-reigning, as it were, in heaven. This becomes a significant development within Judaism, and it flows directly into the New Testament, because Jesus is going to identify himself as the Son of Man. And he is the one who will one day reign over all creation. Because what's happening there, go read Daniel 7. It's all talk of kingdom and reigning and reigning eternally. And now what's even cooler is that the, the phrase son of man shows up 12 times in 
the Gospel of John. Now, numbers are significant to John. So the fact that the phrase Son of Man shows up 12 times, it's very intentional. John is communicating something. The number 12 represents governance. That's God's governance or divine order. And in Daniel, the Son of Man is given authority to reign over a kingdom that's eternal. And so it's a way for John to tell us that this is who Jesus is identifying with. He's the cosmic Son of Man who reigns in the heavens, who shares authority with the Father. Okay, so Daniel 7 is another one. But again, you can see that pattern. Now, um, I mentioned this before, but paradox. Paradox is, uh, the mystics love a paradox because it's where they exist. They recognize the tensions that exist within God's creation, and they're comfortable enough to enter those tensions and sit because there you discover more about God. I mean, it's this, what we just talked about. How, how does God have no image? and yet Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God is sovereign, but we have free will. You know, even something as simple as, in order to live, you must die. So, John, the Gospel of John is riddled with paradox, and he never once makes an attempt to resolve any of them. He leaves you sitting in the tension. So, the mystics don't run from a paradox. They're not afraid of them. In fact, they embrace them. They enter them. And they use them to contemplate God. Since God, of course, is so far beyond us, that's, you know, part of the mystical tradition. It has to be based in humility. Because you have to have the virtue of humility to say, I don't know about God. And I'm going to enter into that experience so I can understand more. Okay, finally, this one, um, it's not final, my, my bad. Mystical union, this is the goal of the mystics, to experience the presence of God. Okay, now the last one. This is the one, the final one that I'll mention today. Uh, The creation story is very important for the mystics. They poured over that creation story, turning it over and over and over and over. Now they're doing this in the Hebrew language, which is going to be much different than English. And they contemplated the words and the letters and the spaces between the words. And they looked at the paradoxes, you know, like the image of God business, right? How are we made in the image of God? How did an infinite God, how is he able to interact with a finite universe? And what we see, the creation story, it's the first real story of salvation, of an exodus, of the redemption out of the chaotic waters there, verse 1 and 2 and into divine order. Now, man eventually throws that back into chaos, but Genesis sets a pattern. Now, we have a few lessons on this, uh, on the pattern found in Genesis. It'll blow your mind. Once you see the pattern and how it flows through the Bible right up to Jesus, it's remarkable. But there's a pattern set in creation. Okay? And the Gospel of John, then, is modeled on creation. And what he's saying is, there's a new birth. It is, in a sense, a new birth, a recreation. The entire cosmos is being born again in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Look, simply look at the first sentence of John, in the beginning, and it sends your mind right back to Genesis 1. And then what John's going to do is he's going to walk through this with seven signs. And of course, as we look through these signs, you're going to find out that the sixth sign is the raising of a man out of the earth. It's just like creation. Now, let me point something out here, one thing to notice. In the Gospel of John, Jesus walking on water is not one of the signs, okay? I want to make sure I I mention this, because on the internet, not everything on the internet is accurate. On the internet, there are many lists out there of the seven signs, and many people put walking on water as one of those signs after the feeding of the 5,000, but that is not correct. 
So make sure if you see a list that you check which signs are included. And if they include the walking on water, that's incorrect. Okay. Jesus raises a man out of the dirt. And then the seventh sign is the crucifixion. And you think, what? How does that work? This is another paradox. How is this the pinnacle of God's glorification? It's a paradox in that you die to live. It takes initiation to understand the significance of it. There's a mystical aspect because we internalize what's going on and then we're able to have God reveal to us the the true nature of it. And then what we see in John is there's a new beginning, right? So after the resurrection, the way John begins things is on the first day of the week, as if the seven days is over, but now it's post-resurrection. Creation itself has been renewed. And now, everything is stepping off brand new. This structure is very intentional on John's part. Very intentional. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's communicating something profound through the structure of his gospel. Okay? Now, go back to our first question. Is John a mystical book? Well. If you line all of these up, right, light versus darkness, Genesis 28, and Jacob's ladder, the being able to see into the veil being pulled back, the heavenly veil being pulled back and being able to see reality beyond, his reliance on Ezekiel and Ezekiel's visions. You have the visions from Daniel and the Son of Man, given authority and glory and sovereign power and all the nations and all the people are going to be worshiping this Son of Man, and it's an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom will never be destroyed. What's John telling us? Jesus is that Son of Man. You have paradox everywhere, and he just lets you sit in it. And then finally, and this is one of the main structures within, is the idea of creation. With all of this, And you start to say, I think there's something happening here that's rather mystical. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do over the next few um, is I'm going to be talking in general, uh, talk about the mystics in general. We'll talk about senses of reading the Bible. How can we read deeper into that text? And then we're eventually going to get to John 1. And of course, that sends us right back to Genesis and the Logos, the Word of God. Logos is Greek. Memra, the Memra of God, M-E-M-R-A. If you want to Google the Memra of God, um, that's Aramaic. And there's hundreds of years of tradition and wisdom thinking about the nature of reality and some agent or something that stands between God and man and is, a, like Paul says, all creation came through him. I think, well, John even says that as well. So we're going to, we're on our way, folks. This is to a deeper understanding of, of not only John, but of Jesus and God and the, the, the nature of reality around us. And I pray that you can join us. This is going to be a magical, mystical journey towards the presence of God and a union, mystical union with Jesus. Okay, we hope you can join us. Thank you. <music>